Welcome in, welcome in, new and existing poets. Thank you for choosing to be here and step on the path of the poets. I'm so excited to be guiding you through this very special Black History Month edition of a poetry intro. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Damiana Willis. I go by Goldmine, The Light, and I'm a poet. I'm also a creative writer, an author, an activist, and a holistic health entrepreneur and enthusiast. I began my personal poetic journey in my tender toddler years, thanks to my uncle Suavel, who, as far as I can remember, has always been writing me and reading me poetry. I continue to write through my years up through elementary, and I was lucky enough to have such amazing elementary teachers as Sheila Martin and Juanita Robertson that encouraged and nurtured and helped me cultivate my voice in poetry and through poetry. So my goal here with this intro is to not only introduce you to some historically impactful poets, African-American poets, but help you seek your voice and know how powerful it is and that your voice matters. So hopefully you can find some inspiration and even have a little fun during this intro. If you haven't already, grab a paper and a pen and let's get started. Poetry matters, but why? What do you think the purpose of poetry is? Write one sentence about what you think the purpose of poetry is. There's no right or wrong answer, just your opinion of your experience with poetry so far about what you think the purpose of it is. One minute. All right, what is poetry? A spoken and written form of art, a tool, liberation, a gift, a life changer. Poetry is vital to culture and history, predating literacy and preceding prose in all literatures. True poetry comes from the heart. It's not meant to just be an exercise of wordplay and cliche. Poetry is meant to tell readers your unique experience and perspective. You are the poetry. Seek your own voice. As soon as you set your intentions to convey that which is in your heart and in your mind, you've become a poet. And the great words of my Uncle Swadell Tolliver. Let's explore some more powerfully impactful poems written by African Americans throughout history. Historically impactful poets, and these are just a few, very few of the many, but starting with our foremother and forerunner, Phyllis Wheatley, Kwame Alexander, Maya Angelou, Tupac Shakur, Amanda Gorman, and Eusini Perkins. Again, many, many, many more, and I encourage you to look them up. Miss Phyllis Wheatley, she was enslaved as a child and purchased at an auction at about eight years of age where her master's mistress taught her to read and write. It was her bravery that opened the door of opportunities for all African-American writers. And it was her poetry that ultimately freed her with the recognition and assistance from her friends in England. Miss Phyllis Wheatley in 1773 became the first person of African descent and American slave whose work had been published. With this great accomplishment, this made her the third American woman to have her works published and also to work with a team of women. Moreover, Miss Phyllis Wheatley was the first African American woman to be paid and make a living from her writing.
Kwame Alexander. Kwame Alexander was rooted and raised in writing, specifically poetry, as the son of an English teacher and history professor. He's now an award-winning New York Times bestselling author of more than 32 books, including poetry, ya, and children's literature and nonfiction. The poem and book that we're going to read shortly, Undefeated, The Undefeated, was published in 2019. You can follow along in your text, or you can see it on the screen. This is for the unforgettable, the swift and sweet ones who hurdled history and opened a world of possible. The ones who survived America by any means necessary, and the ones who didn't. This is for the undeniable, the ones who scored with chains on one hand and faith in the other. This is for the unflappable, the sophisticated ones who box adversity and tackle vision, who shine their light for the world to see and don't stop till the break of dawn. This is for the unafraid, the audacious ones who carried the red, white, and weary blues on the battlefield to save an imperfect union. The righteous marching ones who say we shall not be moved because black lives matter. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unlimited, the unstoppable ones, the dreamers and the doers who swim across the big sea of our imagination and show us and show us the majestic shores of the promised land. The Wilma Rudolphs, the Muhammad Ali's, the Althea Gibsons, the Jesse Owenses, the Jordans and the LeBrons, the Serenas and the Sheryls, the Reese Whitleys and the Undiscovered. This is for the unbelievable, the we real cool ones. This is for the unbending, the black as the night is beautiful ones. This is for the underdogs, and the uncertain, the unspoken, but no longer untitled. This is for the undefeated. This is for the undefeated. This is for you and you and you, Jamie, and you, Imogen. This is for you. This is for us. After listening to that poem, The Undefeated by Kwame Alexander, what stood out to you the most about the poem, the speaker, or the audience? What do you think is the purpose of Kwame Alexander's poem? Is the title fitting for the poem? How does it relate? Take a few minutes to answer these questions.
Read the poem on the following page aloud, slowly and clearly. How do you believe Maya Angelou felt when writing this piece? What effect is created by repeating the phrase, still I rise, and what does it mean? What effect is created by the question in her poem? To whom is she asking them? Maya Angelou was an American memorist, poet, and civil rights activist. She was also a scholar, singer, and dancer. Miss Angelou was best known for her unique and pioneering autobiographical writing style. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, and several books of poetry, and is credited with a list of plays, movies, and television shows spanning over 50 years. She received dozens of awards and more than 50 honorary degrees. Take a few moments to read the poem, Still I Rise, slowly, clearly, and aloud before answering the questions on the previous page. Till I rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by the soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meetings of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Let's revisit those questions. How do you believe Maya Angelou felt when writing this piece? What effect is created by repeating the phrase, still I rise? And what exactly does it mean? What effect is created by the questions in her poem? And to whom is she asking them?
If you haven't already, begin answering these questions. Tupac Shakur is a poet, rapper, actor, and activist who was named after a Peruvian revolutionary named Tupac Amaru II, who led an uprising against the government. He uses this story of his name as a reminder to never compromise himself and never quit. Even though his recording career only lasted around five years, since then, he's been widely considered one of the most influential and successful rappers of all time. Tupac is amongst the best-selling music artists, having sold more than 75 million records worldwide. Here's one of his famous poems, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. Did you hear about the rose that grew from con the crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else even cared. Take a moment to look at the poem. Reread it aloud to yourself or uh, to yourself or aloud before answering the questions on the next slide. What is the poem "The Rose That Grew from Concrete" about? What does the rose represent? How about the concrete? What does that represent? Do you notice any patterns in rhyme? Take a few moments to answer those questions. Eusini Eugene Perkins. You see me, Eugene Perkins, a Chicago native, distinguished poet, playwright activist, and youth worker. He founded the Association for the Positive Development of African American Youth in 1991, which he served as president. You see me, social and artistic works have had such an impact that February 25th, 1999 was proclaimed You see me, Eugene Perkins Day in Chicago. He is known for one of his famous poems starting as a song in a play, later turned into a book, Hey Black Child. Let's listen. Hey Black Child, do you know who you are? Who you really are? Do you know you can be where you want to be if you try to be what you can be? Hey, black child, do you know where you're going? Where you're really going? Do you know you can learn what you want to learn if you try to learn what you can learn? Hey, black child, do you know you are strong? I mean, really strong. Do you know you can do what you want to do if you try to do what you can do? Hey, black cow, be what you can be. Learn what you must learn. Do what you can do. And tomorrow, your nation will be what you want it to be. <laughs> Nice 
<laughs> All right. After hearing that young lady recite Eusini Eugene Perkins' poem, Hey Black Child, what are your thoughts? Fun fact, the poem, Hey Black Child, is commonly misattributed to either Maya Angelou or County Cullen, also great, well-known poets. But this one is by Yusini himself. Again, starting as music and later turned into a poem in a book. Hey, Black Child. Amanda Gorman is from Los Angeles, California, the youngest inaugural poet in the U.S. history, as well as the first ever National Youth Poet Laureate. She's an award-winning writer and cum laude graduate of Harvard University. A fun fact is that she has a speech impediment, which she improved upon throughout her childhood by writing and reciting poetry. Let's listen to her famous inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. Poetic devices, figurative language. There are tons of literary devices to use when writing poetry. However, only some of them are listed here and only the highlighted ones will be defined in depth. I encourage you to copy this list and study the definitions of the devices we don't cover in this workshop. Let's go over this list quickly. Metaphors, idioms, similes, rhyme, imagery, hyperbole, personification. What's in your toolbox? Again, these are just options of things to use. And we'll be going further into metaphors, similes, imagery, and personification. Metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech that makes an implicit non-literal comparison between two unlike things, usually by saying that one thing is another thing. For example, in Maya Angelou's Still I Rise, she says, I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Why does Maya Angelou use this metaphor? What does it imply about her? Another metaphor, an extended metaphor, is in Tupac's The Rose That Grew From Concrete, as well as Amanda Gorman's The Hill We Climb. Those are both extended metaphors. The one in the rose that grew from concrete, he uses the metaphor comparing himself to the rose and the concrete being his environment. How does Tupac compare to the rose and the concrete? Why is this extended metaphor effective? Although not listed in Amanda Gorman's The Hill We Climb, 
she uses the extended metaphor of the hill we climb to compare the country's obstacles to that of going uphill, a struggle. Another poem not listed here that I encourage you to look up is by another author who's not listed, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The poem, The Masks, The Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He uses a similar comparison, an extended metaphor of the mask that we wear. At the bottom, you'll notice pictures of metaphors that you've probably heard before, at least one or two. Metaphors are used to create vivid imagery. Using the images above, see how many metaphors you're already familiar with. Write your answer on a separate page. Did you get them? A heart of gold. You're the apple of my eye. My brother's a night owl. That was the icing on the cake. These are all metaphors that you've probably heard before. Comparing by saying that one thing is another. Similes. A simile makes an explicit comparison between two unalike things, similar to a metaphor, but typically using the words like, as, or than. Quiet as a mouse. As wise as an old owl. Like two peas in a pod. As sick as a dog. Shine bright like a diamond, <laughs> as light as a feather, and blind as a bat. I'm sure you heard one of those, at least the shine bright like a diamond from Miss Rihanna, right? Can you think of any other everyday similes that you've used or heard that aren't listed? Try to think of two and write them down. Imagery. Imagery is a literary device that uses vivid description to appeal to a reader's senses. Imagery is used in normal conversation. Can you think of a time you described an experience you had with a friend what words did you use to describe it to your friend? What pictures did you paint in their mind? It was from either of these categories. Auditory, something you could hear. As we walked up the stairs, the, it squeaked and creaked. Organic feelings, describing love or fear, right? Describing a feeling. Gustatory is describing a taste. So, The soup tastes awful. Like it had been sitting for a while. It tastes like salty sunflower seeds. Can you almost taste the salt? Then you have visual. That's an obvious one. 
when you describe what something looks like, that's the most common way of describing something. Tactile, touch. Describing how something feels to the touch, the physical touch, unlike the organic feeling. When I put my hands near the heater, it felt like a thousand prickly needles kinesthetic movement. She moved her body on the dance floor like a blow up balloon. olfactory smell my brother's room reeked of dirty gym socks you get the picture let's continue as we'll learn more about imagery in the make it make sense exercise no worries Personification. Personification is the at, a, attribution of human or animal characteristics to inanimate objects, abstract ideas, or other things for rhetorical or artistic effect. For example, in Amanda Gorman's The Hill We Climb, she said, while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. History is not a human, so it can't see, but she personified history by giving it eyes, by saying its eyes are on us. Another is, the sun kissed my face all over as I walked outside the dark arcade. The sun kisses. Here's a familiar one. Love is blind. And last, the leaves dance to the music of the wind in the evening. Look around you. Personify the first object that sticks out. Anything. Ceiling fan, book, computer, phone. Take a few moments to write your two personification examples down. Poetic devices part two, sound devices. There are tons of sound devices to use when writing poetry. However, only some of them are listed here and only the highlighted ones will be defined in depth. I encourage you to copy this list and study the definitions of the devices we don't cover in this workshop. Rhyme, assonance, consonance, alliteration, euphony, cacophony, rhythm, and onomatopoeia. Many, many more. We'll be highlighting rhyme, alliteration, and onomatopoeia. Rhyme. Rhyme is a word that has the same last sound as another word or the use of words that have the same last sound in poetry or literature. We've all heard rhyming words. We do it on accidents at times. For example, clock, lock, rock, block. They all have that underlying ock sound. Or het, cat chat and mat think of your favorite food now list five words that rhyme with it write those words down
Alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of the same sound at the start of a series of words in succession, creating a lulling lyrical or motivational effect. Here's one that I got from my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Sheila Martin. I believe it's actually a rendition from Dr. Seuss and it's the making midnight music in the moonlight. Mumbling mice, or is it mighty nice? But we hear the M's. The M's are the alliteration. The making midnight music in the moonlight. Mighty nice. Also, Amer Amanda Gorman use it, uses alliteration in the hill we climb as well. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. Also, Kwame Alexander in The Undefeated said, this is for the unforgettable, the swift and sweet ones, the hurdled history, who hurdled history and opened a world of possible. So we hear the alliteration in the swift and sweet and also the who hurdled history. Take a few moments to think of a few sentences that use alliteration. Onomatopoeia is the act of creating or using words that include sounds that are similar to the noises they refer to. Onomatopoeia is most commonly used in common book, comic books, music, or lyric verse. Some examples would be like a boom bap beats. This is used to describe a particular type of hip hop beat. Or here's a familiar one, the boom, boom, pat, boom, boom, pat, boom, boom, pat. Or from Little Richard, a wop, baba, loo, bop, bop, bam, boom. Or even a more familiar one, ba, da, ba, ba, ba. I'm loving it. McDonald's. So you've heard onomatopoeia all around you. Take some time to either find onomatopoeia in some literature or to make up your own. Word recess. Let's have a bit of fun with word recess. For these wordplay exercises, you'll need to draw four equally large boxes on your page. Follow the examples below using your own words to fill in each of the boxes. Starting with opposite pairs. Opposite pairs are just that, pairs that are opposite, day and night, light and dark, up and down, in and out. Hey, peanut butter and jelly. I'll save some for you. Come up with a, a list of four opposite pairs. Once you've made your list of four opposite pairs, we'll move on to the next box, Righteous Rhymes. Imagine your opposite pairs are at odds. Who would have guessed? <laughs> they burst into an argument and your task is to conclude it in two to three lines that rhyme. For example, 
I'll choose the opposite pair day and night. No need to fight, for each of you hold your own special light. Now your turn. Your task is to conclude one of your opposite pair's arguments in two to three sentences that rhyme. Moving on to the third box. Make it make sense. Poems can, but don't have to rhyme or even make sense. In this box, your task is to write a poem of at least five lines describing your happiest memory or the first one that comes to mind. Try remembering as many details as you can about how it looked, felt, smelled, etc. This will bring you back to that wondrous moment. Closing your eyes can help hold the vision. Once you're there, you can bring the reader in as well by using imagery. Write in detail about your experience using only your five senses, one sensory descriptor per line. Here's my example, Chicago summers. I miss the stench of burning blue magic grease with hints of Harold chicken in a Newport breeze. The salty sweet taste of Garrett's popcorn covered in caramel and cheese. The sound of flying cars whiz by over my head the ill screech. Feeling the frantic squeeze of my aunt's loving hands pulling me back into her reach, eyeing all the crooked signs from Lakeshore Drive to Southside's Concrete Beach. Notice the underlying words. Descriptions for the senses. Stench relates to olfactory or smell. Salty, sweet taste would be taste, <laughs> the sound, the feeling, and eyeing are all descriptions for sight, feeling, hearing, and touch. Take your time to complete your poem of at least five lines. Quick tip, don't be intimidated by all, the tech, by all the techniques you've just learned and have yet to learn. Most new writers use literary devices unknowingly and later come to rec recognize that they've done so. They're just tools, tools to help you depict a masterpiece already within you. Remember, you are the poetry. Types of poetry. Before we dive into the many forms of poetry, let's revisit our question from earlier. What do you think the purpose of poetry is? Look back at your answer. Is your answer the same or slightly different? How has what you've learned so far affected your previous answer? Types of poetry forms. Haiku, limerick, ode, acrostic, sonnet, ballad, free verse, senquain, Rendezvous and Lyric. We will be highlighting haiku, acrostic, free verse, haiku. A haiku is an unrhymed verse form of Japanese origin. 
It consists of three lines with 17 syllables written in a five, seven, five syllable count. A haiku can be about anything, but traditionally describes nature and expresses simplicity, intensity, and directness. Here's my example. Between pine branches, the sun quietly kisses the cool placid lake. Five, seven, five syllables. B, tween, pine, branches, five, the, sun, quietly, kisses, seven, the, cool, placid, lake, five. Let's hear another example by Richard Wright. A falling petal strikes one floating on a pond, and they both sink. Powerful imagery used in haikus. Now it's your turn. Your first challenge is the haiku. Your first poem is a haiku a three line, five, seven, five syllable poem. For your first challenge, you'll be writing a few haiku. Just as a photo captures a single moment in time, so should your haiku. Think of your poem as a quick snapshot. This poem should paint a picture in your reader's minds. Use the images below as inspiration for each haiku or Think of a specific experience you had in nature. Have fun with it. Acrostic. An acrostic is a type of poem that uses the letters of other words to form a word itself. The most common word order taking place at the beginning. Here's my example. Poet. Purest when penned, but most powerful when spoken, is the perspective. Of the odd and observant, often ostracized and outspoken, reflective. Even if just through poems, Eternally expressing through ever subjective poetry. The truest way to see the only way known to me is that of effective poetry. I use alliteration here, rhyme, but more importantly, I spelled the word poet while describing it. Now you try. Your second challenge is the acrostic poem. Take a moment to reflect on the type of person you are. How do you show up in the world? What makes you, you? Use the words and images that come to mind about yourself to write an acrostic poem. The first letter of each line or stanza should come together to create your name. The best poets are naturally observers, possessing a keen awareness of their environments and selves and are often deeply reflective. Reverse, my personal favorite. Free verse poetry is an open form of non-metrical writing that uses organic rhythms of deliberate irregular irregularity. Okay. 
Free verse poetry is an open form of non-metrical writing that uses organic rhythms of deliberate irregularity, improvatory delight. Here's my example. Never will they decipher the complexity of my beauty. It runs inverse, root deep. With shallow petals they paint silently. I am the simple stain that taints the euphoric portrait of a homogenous society. Inaudible cries for my withering demise don't at all surprise me. With detriment I resist the merciless wind, for today I shall not wilt away, or here marks the beginning of the end. Standing alone with only my pride as defense and fallen dreams of my kind to avenge, Melancholy hands of a sullen gray sky hold hostage my fiery drive, and still I strive. Soil bound, I stand my ground. For my cause, I'm forever devoted. Solo, I sway not, a dandelion among roses. Final challenge. Your turn, write and recite. Reflect on all the previous poems and the poets behind those words. What techniques did they use to invoke action or evoke emotion? Practice using some of the same techniques in your own rhymed free verse poem. The poem should give your perspective on a serious issue in your community, country, or the world. Once you're finished, you'll need to recite your poem to someone in order to complete the final challenge. If you don't have anyone to recite it to, you can also record yourself to complete this challenge. Don't hold back, be vulnerable, be risky, be creative, but more importantly, seek your voice. Remember, the real magic of poetry comes from the intent and extent of your expression. Congratulations, you are a newborn poet and your voice matters.